after a long period of environmental dark ages, we are now leaving that and we are entering a period of environmental green ages. In the actual medieval European dark ages, if you sinned, you could pay a fee to a Catholic priest to have your sins removed. So you would be purified, cleansed, purged of the sins, right? So that in the afterlife, you would avoid hell. Now, what is hell? It's somewhere inhospitable, where you don't want to be, somewhere very hot. It's a punishment, right? Now, that was in the medieval Europe, right? In the past. Nowadays, though, we are also putting price on bad behavior, on an environmental sin. And what is the most universally recognized environmental sin, if you allow that analogy? It is the release of greenhouse gases, these planet warming emissions. We are putting price on it in an attempt to reduce their release to the atmosphere so that we avoid warming planet and turning it into something very hot, inhospitable, like hell, metaphorically speaking. Now, in this video, we will contrast the dark ages when they try to put price on sin and when they created these sin markets. We look what happened there and it, it didn't end up well. And we will contrast that with our modern way of putting price on environmental sin, the re release of these planet warming emissions, right? And the point here really is to learn from the past mistakes in medieval Europe so that we don't repeat them now, contemporary, in our modern times, right? As we exit environmental dark ages and enter environmental green ages. I am Jan from sustainablebutterflies.com.au. On the screen you see the five pillars of sustainability, but the content of this video doesn't really neatly slot into any, under any of these pillars. We're looking at the kind of bigger picture stuff here, right? So let's go to dark ages first. If you were a 14th or 15th century layperson, normal ordinary person, and you committed a sin, you could pay a fee, uh, you could buy a token, which was called religious indulgences, from the Catholic priest. And the priest in this exchange, right, a monetary exchange, this transaction, would remove, remove the sin, it, he would purge you or cleanse you of the sin. Right? So that in the afterlife you wouldn't go to hell, but you would go to heaven. This idea was rooted in the concept of purgatory, which is this spiritual realm that everyone enters in the afterlife, where it's like a balancing act or a tri trial that you enter and based on the accumulated good or bad deeds, right, you would either go to hell or to heaven. So that was the idea, right? And because the medieval ages, during these days, people were very uh, superstitious, A and B, they couldn't read until the late 14th century, the Catholic priests had total power and total control of, uh, of disseminating the truth and uh, knowledge and uh, what was written in the Bible, in the scriptures, because People couldn't read and books were not available to ordinary people. Now, this trade totally boomed, right? Totally boomed. Because the people were fear, fearful, they didn't want to go to hell and they couldn't read. And the Catholic Church grew richer and richer, right? Initially, these indulgences, the, the revenue from them, was used to build hospitals and shelters for the poor and charitable causes. But... As, as this trade boomed, the church became corrupt and greedy and they started charging more people and a greater variety of sins and indulgences, right? So they were taking from the poor to build their opulent palaces, uh, host feasts, accumulation of met, uh, assets, uh, wearing expensive robes, right? And created this difference between the, the normal kind of ordinary people and this wealthy and greedy church. But it worked, right? Because people were fearful, they couldn't read. But then 
educational reforms of King Charles IV of the Holy Roman Empire, he instigated uh, these reforms which allowed more and more people to read, right? And people could then access these biblical scriptures firsthand. And what did they read about in the Bible? They read about the principles of poverty, modesty and uh, humility, right? Don't take too much, just share with everyone, just live on nothing and pray for God, right? That stuff. And what did they see the clergy, these uh, brokers of divine word do? Well, the opposite, right? Getting fat, gluttonous, greedy, just hoarding, uh, get, uh, wearing expensive robes, building palaces, etc. Right? So there was complete disconnect. So now people could read, right? Not only Bible, but they could read the texts of the first church reformers, right? And the first of them was John Wycliffe, who was an English theologian and philosopher. John Wycliffe advocated for, for the Catholic Church to go back to basics. He renounced uh, the religious indulgences. He said that's completely corrupt concept. Get rid of it and go back to basics. Uh, renounce gold, robes, palaces and all opulence, even the concept of purgatory. The second reformer was Jan Hus, who was uh, the Czech uh, reformer and uh, philosopher and theologian. Jan Hus moved from the opulent St. Vitus Cathedral to more modest Bethlehem Chapel in the old town, they both in Prague, and he preached modesty, again, uh, building on uh, John Wycliffe's ideas, uh, humility, uh, get rid of the religious indulgences, that's like, uh, that's like hell's, like devilish kind of thing. And because of this, Jan Hus was hated by the church, by the Catholic church, and even by the king, because the king himself was getting the cut uh, from the, the sale of these indulgences. So he was hated, but people loved Jan Hus because they could relate to him. He preached what was actually written in the Bible, right? So people formed this movement around Jan Hus called the Hussites. And this movement culminated in the period of 10 years uh, of wars, which were called the Hussite Wars, between these reformers and the soldiers of the Holy Roman Empire. And Hus was burnt at the stake for heresy in 1415. Now, the most famous and well-known church reformer, of course, was 100 years after Hus, Martin Luther, the father of Protestantism. Now, Martin Luther said, Ich bin ein Hussite. I am, I am a Hussite, right? Because he, he built on John Wycliffe's and Jan Hus's ideas, right? Now, Unlike John Wycliffe and Jan Hus, though, Martin Luther, because he came later in the 16th century, he had the benefit of the printing press, right? Which allowed him to share his reformist ideas, uh, to share them at scale with hundreds of thousands, if not million people. And he also translated Bible to German from uh, Latin, uh, which made it accessible to lay people, to normal people. And, and what happened, of course, you know, is the, the church reformation uh, and then Protestantism. So this, what happened in the Dark Ages, was our attempt to put the price on bad stuff, on sin, with the, with the idea that if you do that, you would avoid hell, somewhere inhospitable, and you would go to heaven, right? And it became very corrupt. Right? It became very corrupt and it resulted in Protestantism and Catholicism that split, right? Now, you might laugh as, oh, this is crazy, you know, you can't compare that with carbon markets and climate change, this is totally separate. But let me give you a little, little, little angle on this, right? Now, of course, these two things are different, but what we're trying to do with carbon markets, we are also putting price on something bad, something like environmental sin, which is the release of greenhouse gases, 
planet warming emissions, right? In an attempt to avoid something very bad, like hell, like a hot planet, global warming, right? Inhospital blah, blah, and to create something akin to maybe not a heaven, but planet that is here for future generations, right? We can call it heaven. It doesn't really matter the term, right? So there are of course different these two things because in the dark ages, the, the, the whole market, sin market is subjective because someone decides what is sin, maybe it isn't, it could be corrupted, it is subjective. Whereas the carbon release of greenhouse gas emissions, it's objective because they are physically being emitted. We have technology that measures it. We have accounting frameworks that account for it, whether it's scope one, two or three emissions. What are the sources of the emissions? Is it uh, cars or uh, power plants? Or is it uh, methane from food waste, etc.? So that is different. However, the idea that you price something bad in order uh, to benefit later, that idea is the same. So let's keep that historical example in mind as we look at carbon markets, right? Because we are living in times of environmental sins and we have made the decision that we will price them. This is not my idea, right? Now, there were many there or they are many environmental sins, whether it's ocean pollution, deforestation, the loss of coral reefs and loss of biodiversity and many other. But what is the most universally accepted uh, environmental sin, if we call it this way, um, among most countries? Well, it is the release of greenhouse gases, right? Uh, whether it was Kyoto Protocol or the Paris Agreement, uh, which was signed by 200 countries, right? All of whom decided and pledged to limit warming and, and move towards net zero. So to limit the warming and reaching net zero is our modern goal. That's what we want, that's what we want to achieve. It's similar to what in the dark ages they wanted to achieve, lay people. They didn't want to go to hell, they wanted to go to heaven. That was their goal. So we have that goal to reach net zero and, and limit global warming, right? Uh, but what is our how? How do we get there? Well, in the dark ages, their how, how do they avoid hell and go to heaven? They would buy this token, this religious indulgences on their sin market, right? So that was what they did. What we do, what we do have, we have carbon markets. And it's very important that our deal, our, our how to reach that goal involves carbon pricing. Why? Because we live in, we live in a global market-based, largely capitalist economy. And pricing carbon does this green invisible hand that incentivize or stimulates low carbon business practices while at the same time disincentivize or uh, uh, prohibits or uh, makes more expensive the high carbon or planet warming business practices. That's what Ross Garneau in his book Superpower Towards Low Carbon Future advocates for. He says, yes, we have regulation, yes, we have direct action, but the big deal, the real mechanism that, that is going to get us as a society towards low carbon or post carbon future is market, carbon markets and carbon pricing, provided that the carbon price is sufficiently high enough to stimulate, to incentivize, to motivate business behavior and business activities that will actually result in, in outcomes that are low carbon or reducing carbon. But these activities won't happen unless the business owners, shareholders, CEOs, uh, SMEs, right, are uh, benefiting, are better off from doing the stuff that reduces carbon instead of doing the stuff that increases the carbon, right? For example, a sheep farmer if he makes more money from farming sheep and selling lamb or wool, 
right? Then from planting trees on his farm, which then when they grow, they their carbon sinks, they draw carbon and they store carbon as well. If he makes more money from selling lamp and wool than from planting trees, he'll never be planting trees. But if he makes more money from planting trees, which is low carbon, low greenhouse gas activity, then from breeding sheep, he has he is then incentivized or stimulated or encouraged by the market, right? Encouraged by the market. He might not even care about the environment. He's going to plant trees instead of breeding sheep, and it's already happening. If you are a sheep farmer in New Zealand, uh, you are, uh, you can earn up to five times more uh, by planting trees on your sheep farm than what you are earning or you are earning by breeding sheep, right? As the article linked in my article in the video description shows. Now, how does that work? Well, under the New Zealand Emission Trading Scheme, which is New Zealand's carbon-based mechanism for reaching net zero, right? Under this scheme, you can earn, or the farmers can earn, pro provided it's under that scheme, and it is, it is actually, uh, the, wo the exact wording, wording is in my article linked in the video description. You can earn NZUs, New Zealand Carbon Units. It's the equivalent of ACCUs, Australian Carbon Credit Units. And because recently the, the, the value of these units increased so much, right, that is high enough incentive, high enough carbon price that makes these changes, these, this decision making of the farmers that they see now they can be so much better off by planting trees on their sheep farm, so that they actually do, right? That's the point. This is the, this is the mechanism. It is, it is in, in principle the same mechanism of the religious indulgences where you buy this token and it in, with view of going to heaven, like in a big scale, this these NZUs or ACCUs or any other carbon pricing token is the mechanism for avoiding hell, uh, uh, hot planet, and, and kind of uh, facilitating or safeguarding uh, a hospitable or livable planet, right? Through this mechanism, modern mechanism. Now, what do you think? Is the green or carbon market good enough to get us to low carbon world or post carbon world? Well, I don't believe so. I don't think so. I think that we need regulation, direct action and pricing the carbon. And here is why. Car uh, markets can be corrupted. We saw what happened when they tried in medieval ages to price bad behavior sins, right? It went completely pear-shaped, it was corrupted, and it resulted in uh, Protestantism and Hussites wars and all of that. So, I'm not saying that's the same situation as today, no, no, no. But, the, if we just rely on carbon markets, we could actually, and that's the, the article actually shows that, we could create green deserts. Uh, if all farmers, or most of the farmers, replace sheep for forests, it will be fantastic, it will sequester or capture a lot of carbon, but it will be terrible for jobs, for local uh, employment, for communities, because once you plant the forest, you, can, you must not touch it for 30 years to actually uh, capture enough carbon and store the carbon in the trees, right, as they grow. And uh, you can't touch it, so that's one thing. The second thing, though, the, the markets themselves, they are blind. I don't believe the invisible hand, even though it's green hand, is, we can trust it. We, I believe we can't. Give you another example. Let's say that you have a, that is a prime, primary rainforest somewhere, uh, five square kilometers. And you approach that primary rainforest through the lens of green carbon markets, right? And you find that there are rare minerals such as cobalt and coltan and copper, um, uh, uh, graphite, underneath the forest. And some calculation will tell you that 
the, the volume, the amount of these minerals under the rainforest will result in 300 car batteries or 20 wind turbines. And the overall uh, benefit is lowering uh, 200,000 CO2 from the atmosphere if you, if you generate lots of renewable energy. But the actual forest that is growing, right, is only capturing, let's say, 50 tons of CO2, right? So if, you, if we approach that primary rainforest through those green market lands, green invisible hand, we could be actually destroying the environment even uh, under the pretext of helping the environment. So I believe we need, we started on the religious theme, so let's end on the religious theme. We need some kind of holy trinity, which is Carbon markets, regulation and direct action. Thank you very much for watching and you have a great day.